Hello, good morning, everybody. I am Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. Thank you for being here um, for our webinar from the US Small Business Administration on the updated um, and expanded PPP loan program. Um, we're gonna go through a bunch of things today, but this webinar um, is one of a large, large group that the, the SBA has been providing to constituents um, to understand how this program is now even more accessible and usable for our small businesses um, here in the 8th District. Um, in a moment, I'm going to inter introduce um, the head of the Great Lakes office for the SBA, and that is um, my friend Rob Scott. He has been instrumental in helping Michigan businesses get what they need. He's in charge of the entire Great Lakes region, but has really paid important attention to our area, particularly in mid-Michigan. And just for a sense of scope, we now, since the program started in early April, have 9,000 businesses in the 8th District, so mid-Michigan from Rochester Hills to Lansing, and it's kept 112,000 people on payroll. The average loan size in our district is about $30,000 to $40,000, but we've had loans as small as $600 and as large as $10 million. So we've really spanned the whole gamut. And um, I want to thank Rob Scott and his team for being available at all hours of the day via email and phone and text in the middle of the night and being willing to talk to um, our local businesses. I know that they've been working really hard to get us the information we need, particularly as the program changes. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob in just a minute, but I wanted to give you some of the highlights because this next round of the PPP loan program was just approved in during the Christmas break. A lot of the loan programs are now just coming online. Um, right now you can apply through a small community bank, but starting on Tuesday, anyone at, through any lender, big or small, can apply for uh, the PPP loan, either a first time loan or a second time loan. And I just wanna give you some of the highlights. Um, so first of all, it's um, $284 billion put into the program. Um, some of that funding was left over from the summer um, when we closed the, the previous round without all the money being spent. And that's different from the first rounds of the program back in April and May when you remember there was a real rush to get in the door. People couldn't get a hold of their lenders. The money was used up in, I think, less than two weeks in that first round. A lot of that had to do with some of the sizes of the loans. You kept you, I'm sure you heard the news about, you know, $10 million loans to kind of the Ruth Chris steakhouses of the world. Um, and we saw almost immediately that the relationship you had with your lender was a big determinant in whether you got in the door for that first round. So we started making adjustments. And a lot of those adjustments were based on your feedback, business owner feedback. And the program has changed a lot. So I, I urge you to kind of listen through the webinar here um, and see if maybe you weren't inclined to apply for a loan back in April or May, but it might make sense now given with the pretty different, you know, the pretty different terms that we have available. Um, uh, okay, so of that $284 billion that are put into the pot, there is a new set aside for companies with fewer than 10 employees. We kept hearing this a lot. Small businesses were caught in this kind of Bermuda Triangle um, of bureaucratic headaches where they, they didn't have enough personnel on their books in order to qualify for some of these programs, which were designed to help people, people on, keep people on payroll. So we now have um, uh, a set aside for companies that are 10 employees or less and for loans um, under $250,000 for some of our disadvantaged communities. So there's set asides for some of the smallest and hardest hit communities. Um, but um, it, the most important thing that I want you to take away that's really different is we now have streamlined the process for loan forgiveness, particularly if you're applying for a loan that's under $150,000. Um, the SBA is working hard right now on a streamlined one page form that would you would be able to take to your lender um, that would help you understand for those loans under 150K, how you get it forgiven. Um, so that's a big difference from a lot of the uncertainty from the, the spring when people said, I don't even wanna take a low interest loan. I'm scared to take on debt. Now you have the opportunity um, to think about having basically uh, free money. Um, and um, important to know um, that uh, it clarifies in this round of the PPP that deductions are allowed for expenses paid for with the proceeds of a PPP loan that is forgiven. 
Um, it, that means uh, additionally that you are not this loan is not going to be seen as taxable income. People were worried about that. There was a lot of questions about that. Um, and um, uh, it, it basically um, uh, makes it easier. It's going to make it easier to get that loan forgiven. I know a lot of you have asked me, you said, I've already spoken to my banker. They don't know what the process is. Um, and that's because literally people like Rob Scott and the Small Business Administration are still just receiving the ball from Congress, making sure that they get that form um, out and streamlined and correct. But it's a, it's a good assumption that you'll need to have you know, you have to show your math. You'll have to show that the loan that you used, uh, that you got was used for the things that it's allowed to be used on. So make sure you have documentation. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is that the, this PPP round can go and be um, used by 501c6 organizations. So a chamber of commerce, a trade association, uh, a tourism office. There's a bunch of categories of businesses um, and organizations that were not covered by this loan program that are now covered because of your feedback. Um, and, um, uh, and then importantly, for our restaurants, I mean, we know that our restaurants own owners have really been where the rubber hits the road. They have been um, at the sort of knife's edge of being open, being shut, being open, being shut. And um, we made some carve outs in this program specifically for our restaurants. Um, and uh, that means that um, we change the calculation on how much you get in your loan. Instead of it being 2.5 times your average monthly payroll cost, for restaurants only, it's 3.5 times your average monthly payroll costs. Um, and then we incorporated a ton of additional expenses that can be covered by the PPP loan. So think about the restaurant specific expenses of perishable goods, food, um, accommodations for outdoor space, all those heaters, all that extra outdoor patio equipment, all of those things are now allowable expenses under the PPP loan program. Um, and I know that Rob and his team will get um, uh, more uh, into it. One last thing, and that's particularly for any of our businesses that qualify as a performance space, a stage. We passed a separate assistance program for stages. So think in the mid-Michigan area, Pine Knob, or it's not Pine Knob anymore, it's DTE Energy Center, but it'll always be Pine Knob, um, Meadowbrook, some of our smaller places that um, like in Lake Orion where you have small stages for music, um, there is a $15 billion um, uh, program that is cut, put aside for uh, grant money for stages. And the SBA has a website up right now with um, uh, sort of frequently asked questions. The program is not yet open, but I want anyone who qualifies as a stage, um, a performance space to get their paperwork in order because that program will open up. And it's particularly to keep our cultural institutions that we all grew up at, that we love, that we want to preserve. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Scott. I want to thank him again. I know this may be the last webinar that we do, the last public event that we do um, together. He has been um, an unfailing um, assistance to me and to my team and to everyone in the 8th District because when we called and our businesses needed him, he was there and he and his team provided um, really kind of like wartime like service to help us get through um, this really, really um, tough time for everybody. So thank you to Rob and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. And uh, I would like to thank you for certainly your leadership in Washington, D.C., your support for the U.S. Small Business Administration and, and everything that we're trying to do and, and make sure that we meet our mission uh, as an organization. Um, one thing I, I will I will tell the folks on this call uh, about the Congresswoman is uh, she's not shy uh, to pick up the phone and call folks directly. Uh, I remember my first phone calls when this pandemic began beginning and I answer the phone and she says, this is, you know, this is Rob. She's like, oh, this is Alyssa Slock. And I'm like, I'm sitting there thinking like, Slock and Slock. And, whoa, whoa, that's a congresswoman because, you know, I know all my folks in my region and, and normally you have a staffer call you. Um, but it, she personally picked up the phone and called me and has since this entire thing asking questions. Hey, what are you hearing? What can I do? What's, what's your advice? Uh, and certainly responded. The other thing I'd like to applaud her on um, obviously, you know, we are in a divided country right now as far as politically, and uh, she was uh, a leader on the Problem Solvers Caucus, which led to us getting this these funds for the next round of PPP and all these resources that we're going to be talking about. So I certainly applaud her for that. 
Um, she is definitely a, a, a very much a quality representative for all of you out there. And I'm just not saying that uh, to say it, it, it literally is proof is in the pudding. So I, I thank her for that and, and her support of the SBA and, and certainly the mission. So thank you, Congress. Um, to talk a little bit about the SBA and, and the Congresswoman took a lot of our thunder, um, but we're we're going to go over it again and, and maybe a little more a little more detail, a little more brass tacks with uh, some of the folks at the agency. But um, the one thing I like to say about our agency is, you know, we may not have all the answers, uh, but we will find you the answers. We have a lot of resource partners that you're going to hear about that we tap into. Um, the one thing I say is like, you know, we are prepaid services. Your tax dollars are paying for us. We don't charge any additional fees. So use us, use us, use us, use us, tap into us, and we will connect you to the resources. During this time, as a small business owner, I know it's tough, and especially there in Michigan. I mean, you guys, um, you know, with the restaurant industry and all the, all the things that are coming down there in Michigan, um, you guys need some help. And that's what this legislation was geared for. That's why President Trump signed it into law. Um, and that's, what, that's why we're doing this webinar with the Congresswoman. So with that, um, I don't want to, I want to get straight to the meat and potatoes. Um, I got some folks here on the call that are going to give a presentation uh, to you all, but we have two offices there in Michigan. Uh, we have one in, in Detroit and we have one in Grand Rapids. So I know the Congresswoman district kind of spans that. Makes me wonder if she is pretty fan. This is coming from a Buckeye. So I mean, you guys can't play football, but you know, you guys can do small business. You guys have a great, you guys have a great small business atmosphere. But that was a little jab from a Buckeye. Um, but with that, I have two folks uh, on the on the call here. Um, there, there's Catherine Gase, who is the lead economic development specialist in in Detroit, and then also Brian Picarazzi, who's the senior area manager in Grand Rapids, and and they are in your local office there in Michigan are certainly available, um, you know, even past this webinar for any of your questions and concerns. But with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Gay. So, Kathy, I take it away. Thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate that. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I'm so pleased to be able to present this to you today. So I would really like to just go over a few of our uh, SBA consulting resources. These resources are available to you at any time. They've been around um, since uh, 20, 30 years, 40 years since the beginning of our agency. Um, they were available pre-COVID. They will be available post-COVID, God willing, one day soon. And uh, But during this COVID recovery period, we have deployed many more dollars to our funded resource partners. And what that means to you is that there are experts on the ground in every community across the state, especially in the 8th District, that um, have been hired and are available to help you wherever you're at at this point in time in your business, whether you're you know, trying to reopen, whether you are in a situation that uh, you're growing because the pandemic presented an opportunity for you, uh, whether you're going through a, a rough time as so many businesses are, we have financial consultants, human resources consultants, um, you know, marketing management, social media, e-commerce, you name it, we've got people on the ground to help you. We've hired and have expertise in, in almost any facet of business. And these are very experienced, credentialed consulting, all our consultants, all of the resources, the consulting resources, and all of our webinars right now are absolutely free. You will never at any time, even after COVID, be charged for any consulting. So I encourage you to take advantage of what we have available because it's just, it's really phenomenal. First of all, you can always reach us at the SBA website in Michigan. It's sba.gov forward slash MI, sba.gov forward slash MI. From that, you can go to our events calendar, but most importantly, I encourage you to sign up for our email bulletins. We send them out about once a week, sometimes more often than, than that, and that gives you an opportunity to learn about what's going on, both from our office and from our funded resource partners. So all the, all the webinars, all the training, um, all the special initiatives that we have, we're going to be uh, recruiting for a special program soon called Emerging Leaders. So, and we'll make sure that the Congresswoman gets that information um, out to you and that'll be posted on our website. So just lots of information and lots of opportunities going on right now to help you. 
Uh, the second resource is the Small Business Development Center. This is again part of the SBA family. This is a national resource available in every uh, district office in every state. And the Small Business Administration, along with local community, or excuse me, uh, universities and colleges and local economic development organizations provide match funding. Again, what that means to you is that you can pick up the phone or better go on to their website, sbdcmichigan.org, sbdcsmallboy.catmichigan.org, sign up for or, or fill out a request for counseling, an intake consultant will get back with you, put you in touch with the person that's more uh, most appropriate to help you, depending on what industry you're in or depending on what type of expertise that you need. Never a charge, always confidential. And again, through the CARES Act funding back in April, we have been able to bring on subject matter experts, uh, service providers that uh, serve small businesses, whether it's uh, you know, a QuickBook uh, consultant or expert, or whether it's a CPA, an attorney, an HR specialist, uh, folks that are running their own business and have expertise. We are paying for, for their services um, to help you, and there's never a charge for that. So please keep that in mind, and I encourage you to reach out to them. For our women business owners, we have an SBA-funded Women's Business Center in three different locations here in the Southeast Michigan area. It's the Great Lakes Women's Business Council out of Livonia. We have one in Grand Rapids and one in Benton Harbor. Again, you can reach them via their websites or their phone numbers. Everyone is working pretty much virtually right now, and but all of our resource partners are have, have really kind of pivoted to putting on webinars that are uh, that address what's what happening right now in the current environment. Four mentors to small businesses. This is a fantastic group of men and women who for the most part have retired from either um, working in industry or have um, owned their own business and have all kinds of experience to share with you. And they like to say that they can be mentors for the life of your business. So again, no matter what stage you're in, um, they are available and there's no limit to the amount of mentoring that you can receive from them. No charge, confidential. We have seven chapters in Michigan. So again, please, please reach out. And then we are uh, obviously very dedicated to um, our veteran community. So we have a, a wonderful organization that we fund as a Veterans Business Outreach Center, and that's called Vet Biz Central. They're located out of Flint, but they serve all of Michigan. And this is staffed by veterans, um, for veterans, so uh, the, the staff at Vet Biz Central know what they're talking about. They know what the veteran community has gone through and some of the um, challenges, and more importantly, some of the opportunities that are out there to do, say for example, business with the federal government as a certified veteran business owner. So again, reach out to them. Um, this recording will be available. Uh, we will post it on our YouTube page, um, probably by Tuesday, and um, we'll share it with a Congresswoman staff. And so all this will be available. At the end of the presentation, I have a slide with our contact information. Again, feel free to reach out to us. We are here to serve you, and it's our honor. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Picarazzi. Brian is our Senior Area Manager, as uh, Rob said, out of uh, Grand Rapids, and he's pretty much an expert on anything uh, PPP and lending. So Brian? Okay, thanks, Kathy. We're going to get right into this. We're going to talk about uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. We have a relaunch overview, as you can see, and this information is current as of January 14th. Quickly, what we're going to talk about, uh, where we are and some key dates. First draw PPP loans and second draw PPP loans. Uh, quick forgiveness updates and uh, what to do now and some additional resources, uh, many of which Kathy just mentioned. So for this uh, legislation that just passed, Congress intended this round of the PPP to increase access to COVID relief funding for the hardest hit small businesses and those in underserved segments, including women, minorities, and veterans. In response, the SBA is initially opening PPP loan applications to submissions from CFIs, uh, which serve underserved communities. Leveraging uh, its lender match platform so borrowers can find these and other participating PPP lenders and continuing to provide trainings, materials, and assistance via SBA field offices and its resource partners around the country. So quickly, you can still apply 
uh, presently through CFIs. They're still taking applications. And if you are looking for a lender, you can go to our website, look for our lender match platform. You can put your information in and your information will be sent out to our entire lender network uh, in hopes of finding a lender for your PPP if you don't already have an institution that you work with. So some, some brief timelines on key dates. I think everybody is aware by now, January 11th, the PPP opened for first draw PPP loan applications from community financial institutions uh, or CFIs. Uh, we define a CFI as either a CDFI or a community development financial institution, a minority deposit institution, uh, a micro lender or a CDC, certified development company. Up until today, those were the only uh, four types of institutions that could accept your application. Um, as of today, uh, institutions with assets of a billion dollars or less are now open uh, to take your applications. And as of uh, come Tuesday, then it will be open across the board to all institutions that are accepting applications. So. Uh, PPP opens first and second draw. Again, applications to lending institutions with a billion or less in assets on January 15th. And then first and second draw applications are open to all other participating lenders on January 19th. All applications have to be submitted uh, by March 31st uh, for this round. Okay, so what is a first draw PPP loan uh, for eligible applicants that did not receive a PPP loan prior to August 9th, 2020? PPP loan eligibility now includes additional types of entities. Uh, covered eligible expenses have been expanded. Borrowers can now select a covered period to use PPP loan proceeds anytime between eight and 24 weeks after disbursement. So uh, if you did take first round of PPP, you're probably aware you had a choice of either eight or 24 week covered period. Uh, this expands that and gives you a little more flexibility to choose anything in between the eight and 24 weeks. So you could choose a 12 week or 13 week or 18 week covered period if you so choose. Certain borrowers may request an increase to their original loan, uh, their original PPP loan amount. So uh, in, in those instances, if you, uh, A, took your PPP and uh, could not use it all, had to give some back because you couldn't use it all during the covered period that you had, you would be eligible to apply through the first draw for the difference uh, of the, uh, of that first round PPP. Um, additionally, if you calculated wrong for some reason the first time around and you actually were funded for less than you were eligible for, you would also be able to qualify under the first draw uh, to reapply for that difference. Again, must apply on or before March 31st, 2021 or until uh, congressional appropriations expire. So I, just real quick, if we, if we can talk about uh, the covered eligible expenses that are expanded. So all of the covered eligible expenses from the first round are still valid, but this has expanded to include covered operations expenditures. So payments for any software, cloud computing, and other human resources and accounting needs are now considered eligible costs. Uh, covered property damage costs, so costs related to property damage due to public disturbances that occurred during 2020 that are not covered by insurance are also now an additional uh, covered cost. Uh, the Congresswoman mentioned this. This is probably important to our restaurants. Uh, covered supplier costs, so expenditures to a supplier pursuant to a contract, purchase order, or order for goods in effect prior to taking out the loan that are essential to the recipient's operations at the time at which the expenditure was made. And supplier costs of perishable goods can be made before or during the life of the loan. So the Congresswoman mentioned many of the things that, that could be used for, um, but uh, again, outdoor, if you're a restaurant and need to expand your outdoor dining, uh, those types of things would now be covered under this um, additional eligible expense category. And then finally, covered worker protection expenditures. So PPE equipment and adaptive investments to help a loan recipient comply with federal health and safety guidelines or any equivalent state and local guidance related to COVID-19 during the period March 1st, 2020 and the end of the national emergency declaration those things are all additional eligible covered expenses. And on top of that, um, the CARES Act allows loans made under PPP before, on, or after the enactment of this act to be eligible to utilize the expanded forgivable expenses except for borrowers who have already had their loans forgiven. So these additional 
eligible covered expenses would be retroactive and eligible on your first PPP loan as long as you already haven't had it uh, been granted forgiveness. So first off, PPP loan eligibility, you must comply with size standards, eligibility criteria, and certain limitations. So newly eligible entities include housing cooperatives, destination marketing organizations, certain 501c6 organizations such as Chambers of Commerce, and eligible news organizations. Still eligible, uh, business entities such as partnerships, corporations, LLCs, sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed individuals, 501c3 nonprofit organizations, 501c19 veterans organizations, and tribal businesses. Okay, so we'll move on to the second draw. What is a second draw PPP loan? So obviously the first draw was for folks that uh, did not get a PPP at all the first time around or fell into those two categories that we talked about. Uh, that is the first draw PPP. So second draw is for borrowers that previously received a PPP loan, have 300 employees or less, and suffered a 25% reduction in gross receipts. For most borrowers, the maximum loan amount of a second draw PPP loan is two and a half times the average monthly 2019 or 2020 payroll cost, up to $2 million. Uh, for borrowers in the accommodation and food services sector, so hotels and restaurants, or NICS code 72, the maximum loan amount for a second draw PPP loan is three and a half times the average monthly 2019 or 2020 payroll cost, up to $2 million. Second draw PPP loan applicants must submit the information on our application, our SBA form 2483SB. Uh, when you apply to your lender, that application and information can be found on our website, sba.gov slash PPP. And just briefly, as we talk about um, the 25% reduction, you can show that a couple of different ways. You can do a, a 2020 to 2019 quarterly comparison. So you could compare your first quarter of 2020 to your first quarter of 2019 to show that reduction. You could show second quarter 2020 to second quarter 2019 to show the reduction, so on and so forth. What you can't do is show um, first quarter of 2020 compared to fourth quarter of 2019 to show that reduction. It has to be an apples to apples comparison. Uh, or alternatively, you could just show an, uh, an annual year over year 25% reduction, full 2020 to full 2019 uh, to show that reduction. Second draw PPP loan eligibility must have previously received a first draw PPP loan additional eligible criteria. Uh, you have to have used or will use the first draw PPP loan amount only for eligible expenses before the PPP second draw loan is dispersed. Can't have more than 300 employees. Can demonstrate at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts between comparable quarters in 2019 and 2020. So the thing to take away from this slide is if you did have first round PPP and you use some of that money for ineligible expenses and you have a loan balance going forward, uh, you would not be eligible for this round. You had to use that first round uh, and you had to be in compliance and use it, uh, use it for eligible expenses. Brian, can you remind us what the eligible expenses were for the first round? Yeah, so rent, utilities, um, monthly mortgage payments, things of that nature. Great. And then also the you know it would also fall under these additional expanded eligible expenses. If you use those the first time around, technically they were ineligible then. Uh, they're eligible in this round, and they are eligible retroactively uh, to that first round. Quick slide on forgiveness. Borrowers must apply for forgiveness through their lender. Lenders submit borrower uh, forgiveness decisions to the to the SBA. So when you do apply for forgiveness, you're gonna submit that information to your lender. They have 60 days to submit it to us, and then we have 90 days to adjudicate that forgiveness process once we receive it from the lender. So uh, we do get a lot of emails saying, hey, you know, I, I uh, applied for forgiveness on December 9th. I haven't heard anything back yet. Can you check on it? Can you tell me what's going on? Um, just be patient with that process. Like I said, you're gonna submit it to the bank. They have 60 days to get it to us, and then we have 90 days to adjudicate that and the forgiveness back to them. 
few other updates per the Economic Aid Act. Uh, idle advances are no longer deducted from forgiveness payments. So if we can take a second just to talk about that. If on the first round uh, you received an idle forgiveness or an idle grant, so the grant's going to be different than, than the full loan. The idle grant, the FAST grant, uh, came quickly. It was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. On the first round in forgiveness, uh, you would have had to deduct that idle fast grant portion from your PPP. So if you received a $50,000 PPP loan and a $10,000 idle grant, uh, upon forgiveness, we would have had to deduct that 10,000. So your maximum forgivable amount would have been $40,000. That has changed in this legislation. Uh, obviously we are no longer required to deduct that from forgiveness payments. So if you haven't, applied or been granted forgiveness yet on the first round, it's really not something you have to worry about. Obviously, we're not going to deduct it. That's, that's clear. If you have, um, if you did take first round money and you have been granted forgiveness and we did deduct your idle fast grant amount, uh, we will be sending um, reconciliation payments back to your lender for the amount of your idle fast grant. And then it'll be incumbent on them to either apply it to your forgiveness uh, balance that you might have left or return those funds to you in another manner. So um, that is going to happen. Be patient with that. Talk to your lender. Uh, but that's how that process will play out. Uh, the Congresswoman talked about this, but forgiven PPP loans are, non, are not taxable income. Expenses paid with PPP loan funds are now tax deductible. Uh, as always, you know, talk to your tax consultant or reference the IRS website for additional details on how that works, but that certainly is part of this new legislation. Expanded forgivable expenses are permissible for any PPP loan not already forgiven. We've talked about those uh, additional eligible expenses. And then, you know, I know, I know we get a lot of questions about the new forgiveness application. Again, the Congresswoman talked about it. Uh, this legislation calls for loans PPP loans uh, under 150,000 to have an application that is no more than one page for forgiveness. Uh, that is true, that is happening. That form is not available yet. Um, it will be here you know, at some point in the near future. So you can choose to hold off and wait for that form uh, if you like. <clears throat> it's gonna be a little simpler than, than the process we had previously, but just know that form will be coming shortly. You'll be able to find it on our website as soon as it's released. Uh, as always, kind of with this PPP program, keep in good touch with your lender if you can. Uh, they'll be able to give you updates. They'll be able to let you know when the application is available, when they're accepting it, and things of that nature. Okay, what to do now and additional resources. Um, so you obviously talk to your lender, uh, especially now if you're thinking about applying and your, your lender doesn't open until Tuesday, be in contact with them. Ask them uh, what you can do. Can you get, your, get them your application early? Are they stockpiling them up on a desk somewhere so they can submit a bunch at once? Are they not accepting them, actually accepting them till Tuesday? That's going to be an individual decision uh, by individual lenders. So just reach out to your lender and see what their process is going to be for that. Again, if you don't have a lender or someone that you're going to work with, you can go to sba.gov slash lender match. Uh, you can put in your information. We'll blast that out to all the lenders in the network that are participating in PPP and uh, hopefully you'll get some contact uh, back from some institutions that are interested in processing that PPP application. You can always go to our sba.gov slash PPP website. We keep that updated. Anything that we talk about on these webinars or uh, any information that we put out is 100% on that website. You can find it there. There's additional information. There's a lot of FAQs. For example, there's FAQs on how do I calculate my payroll costs. Uh, we have some scenarios up there. We have frequently asked questions from folks that are trying to do that, so hopefully you can get that question answered. Um, but certainly use that website uh, as a resource. You can always contact us, your local district office, uh, or resource partners that Kathy talked about. We're happy to help. You can uh, subscribe to our updates and, and newsletters at sba.gov slash updates uh, and follow us on Twitter. So I, I want to briefly just talk about a couple things that the legislation did address. Um, we have made extensions to the debt relief program. Uh, many of you might know if you have an existing SBA loan, uh, we made six months of principal and interest payments for you under the first round CARES Act. 
that program will continue, although in a somewhat limited capacity. So the extension of the debt relief program resumes the payment of principal and interest on small business loans guaranteed by the SBA under the 78504 and microloan programs. All borrowers will qualify with qualifying loans approved by the SBA prior to the CARES Act will receive an additional three months of principal and interest payments starting in February 2021. Going forward, uh, this was not the case the first time around, but going forward, those payments will be capped at $9,000 per month per borrower. After the three-month period that we just talked about, um, borrowers that we consider to be underserved, namely the smallest or hardest hit by the pandemic, will receive an additional five months of P&I payments, also capped at $9,000 per borrower per month. Uh, that would include any borrowers with SBA microloans or 7A community advantage loans, uh, borrowers with 7A or 504 loans in the hardest hit sectors as measured by the severity of sector-wide job losses since the start of the pandemic. Typically, that's going to include your food service and accommodations, uh, arts, entertainment and recreation, venues, education, and laundry and personal care services. Additionally, uh, SBA payments of principal and interest on the first six months of newly approved loans will resume for all loans approved between February 1st and September 30th, 2021, also capped at $9,000 per month. So that means if you are looking for capital outside of either PPP or our idle loan program, we still have our regular conventional SBA programs. Banks are still using them. They're still lending on them. That's our 7A and 504 programs. Uh, if you get a new SBA loan uh, after between February 1st and September 30th, we're going to make the first six months of principal and interest payments for you uh, up to $9,000. Quickly talk about some modifications to our conventional uh, 7A and 504 loan programs. So our 7A loan program Again, this is outside of the PPP or idle kind of special programs. These are our everyday conventional uh, flagship lending programs. Our 7A loan is typically a 75% guaranteed loan program. So uh, the bank would get a 75% guarantee against losses on any money they lend out to businesses through our program. That allows them a little bit more comfort to get capital out on the street to businesses where it might not be the perfect lending scenario. Typically, that's a 75% guarantee. Uh, we're going to increase that to 90%, the loan guarantee amount on 7A loans, uh, including community advantage loans, until October 1st, 2021. We also have an express program. Typically, that express program is a smaller, faster um, loan. Typically, it's a $350,000 limit, max loan amount. Uh, the bank underwrites everything in-house. They receive a 50% guarantee. But because they underwrite it in-house, uh, they can get that money to you faster than our typical 7A program. Um, we are going to increase that maximum dollar amount from $350,000 to $1 million uh, as of January 1st. And then it will revert permanently back to a lower amount of $500,000 on October 1, 2021. Additionally, um, that guarantee that is typically 50% to the bank will increase to 75%. Uh, and for loans above 350000 the guarantee will remain at 50%. So what that means to you, basically, in a nutshell for a business, is we've increased the guarantee percentage to the banks that is going to help them um, more be able to get capital with our conventional programs to businesses because we've increased that guarantee and kind of re in, uh, decreased their risk level even more than what it would be under our normal program requirements. So with that, um, I'm happy to uh, take some questions. Great, thanks, Brian. And let's uh, go to the chat box, the Q and A. All righty. And as usual, Rob has probably answered most of these, but let me, for the, the good of all of us, uh, for the benefit of everyone here, let's go over them. So are there any resources available available for people planning to start a business? Ab absolutely. Those are the resources that I spoke about at the beginning. Rob has posted um, our SBA.gov. You can certainly go to SBA.gov slash MI and refer to the PowerPoint. Um, you can you have my email, I'll, I'll post it here. 
And you can certainly contact me and I will put you in touch with the resource partners in your area and get you connected. So happy to do that. All hey, right, hey, um, go ahead. Yeah. And I just real quick, what I didn't talk about, speaking of additional resources, I just want to quickly, briefly talk about our EIDL program. Um, I think a lot of people know about the EIDL, EIDL or EIDL Disaster Loan Program now. It's been pretty widely publicized, really heavily used uh, since the beginning of this. But I just kind of quickly want to recap it. The EIDL program or the Disaster Loan is still available. You can still apply for it. Uh, you would apply for it. If you go to sba.gov slash PPP, you're going to see uh, information about our idle disaster loan there. The application there is online. It's a loan of up to three, uh, up to uh, $150,000 at 3.75% with a 30 year term for for profit companies, 2.75% for nonprofits, same 30 year term. Uh, that is a little different from the PPP program. As you guys know, the PPP can be forgiven if you uh, follow the, the uh, guidelines and eligible uses. The idle loan is a loan. It will have a payment, but uh, if you apply and receive those funds, there's no payment on it for the first 12 months. So a lot of businesses are kind of taking advantage of applying for it. They don't know if they need it or, or not at this point, but because we have that 12 month payment to throw on there, it gives you some time uh, to consider whether you're gonna need those funds, see kind of where this pandemic takes us. The funds will be there if you need them. If not, you can certainly return them. There's no prepayment penalty. Uh, you can return them in a year. Uh, with a little bit of accrued interest you'd have to pay, but outside of that, uh, you can return it relatively easily and pen penalty free. So if you're on the fence about that idle or if you didn't know about it, um, look into it. It's a good option to have, uh, get your application in and consider you know, setting that money aside for that 12 month grace period and, and see if you're gonna need it. Thanks, Brian. And the, the other okay. thing I wanted to add there, Kathy, is uh, for the, for these programs, the PPP and the EIDL, um, you will have to have a business that uh, was started before that magic date of February 15, 2020. Um, if your business is a startup during uh, you know, the 2020 season after the February 15, um, we do have other traditional resources that you would be at during any other time. It's just the pandemic resources uh, necessarily aren't targeted for uh, startup businesses. Thanks for that, Rob. And let me just put a plug in. Uh, the Michigan District Office has been putting on our financing roundtables, how to get a business loan. We do them about every three weeks. So again, sign up for our email updates. And yeah, they're about a two hour webinar. We bring in a, a lender. Um, I, I present and we have one of our business consultants on and it's uh, an opportunity to ask as many questions as you have and we will get through that. Okay. Um, what about uh, those who pay employees 1099? So the, the answer, the short answer is the 1099 folks are able to apply for EIDL, but you can't as a business owner claim or count the 1099 employees in your calculations. Rob or Brian, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think you meant the PPP program. You said EIDL. Um, I'm sorry. That be, yeah, that yep, would be the PPP right. program. So when you submit your two and a half months or three and a half months, if you fit into that that category, um, you, you obviously put, you know, payroll on there. If you have 1099 employees, you cannot claim them um, because they themselves can apply for a PPP. So that's why um, they are excluded from that calculation. Great. See, that's why I don't answer questions, Rob. Um, Dana says, can sports and entertainment venue operators that have a primary function of producing minor league baseball games uh, as well as other non-sports related events at their venues apply for the shuttered venues. Yeah, I, I think on the shuttered venues, it, it's still a big question mark. Um, that is gonna be run through grants.gov uh, and they're still, they're still working, working through that. Um, I don't know if the Congresswoman would want, want to add anything to this, but um, I do know, obviously, you would be able to apply for a PPP. The shuttered venues was for venues like, you know, entertainment and uh, theaters and stuff. So I don't know if the sports world 
is going to fit into that category. I hope they do. Um, we're still putting a lot of the guidelines like that. So, uh, Congresswoman, I don't know if you wanted to chime in here. Sure. Um, so, uh, for for folks who know that in our district we have the Lansing lug nuts, we also have a different league that is based out of um, Rochester, um, and we've been working with those folks to, to. We were working to try and get the minor league baseball community um, covered in that sort of save our stages legislation that led to this extra pot of money. And we fought and we were not successful directly um, in, in getting that sort of in the list. Um, but what we're trying to do now and we're engaging with the um, uh, Treasury and with the Small Business Administration is, is there any way to kind of like back end ourselves into some support? Um, so um, maybe if you put your, your information in there, my staffer who's on the line can take it and we can report directly. We're in touch with the head of the lug nuts, um, but we're trying to kind of back end our way into some additional coverage because we don't want our minor league baseball teams to be you know, at risk. They're important, so uh, more to follow, but we're fighting it. And, and the other thing to add to that, I know the SBA, we're partnering with the major national, It's called, I think it's called NEVA, um, it's the venue operators, I, I guess they're all part of it. We're actually partnering with them to be in contact with them and they are kind of helping us also with the guidelines to, to help, okay, what are the needs out there? Because you know we're not experts at running venues and stuff like that. So that would be another resource maybe if uh, they're a part of NEVA or some other organization uh, in order to, to tap into. We have a question about finding out about USDA loans and are they affected by the COVID package as well? There was uh, there was some stuff uh, in the legislation on USDA, uh, CFAP, and there was a couple other programs in USDA loans, but I do have a friend that is there in Michigan, uh, Jason Allen, um, but his tenure is getting ready to end on Wednesday like mine. Um, so what I would probably recommend is let us connect you uh, with, with the careers, put your email on there and we'll, we'll connect you or, or the, I know the Congresswoman's office will definitely connect you. Um, I do apologize, I'm not well versed in the USDA programs. Great. Um, is this PowerPoint presentation on the SBA.gov forward slash PPP site. So we just got it last night. Um, I suspect that the uh, headquarters will put it up, but at this point, I can't say that it's up there at this at this moment. Rob, do you know anything? Uh, yeah, it's going to be made available on our website. It should be today, um, today. because this was the, the approved uh, PowerPoint presentation. But um, the other thing is uh, we will make this uh, uh, recording available, correct, Kathy, to not only the Congresswoman's office, but with the Michigan uh, SBA Michigan District Office. Absolutely. And we have our emails, too, and I posted my email. So if you have follow up questions, you want the PowerPoint, email me directly. Uh, for those of you that maybe have called in, I will give you my email. It's Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E dot Gase, G A. S like Sam, E at SBA.gov. Just feel free to reach out to me and I'll get you this PowerPoint presentation. And for the second PPP loan, if you did apply last year, can you use the 2020 income to apply now? Um, Brian, do you want to chime in here or you want me to take this? Yeah, so, um, so I don't know if they're asking if you would use that 2020, I don't, you know, if you certainly would use the 2020 over 2019 to show the um, revenue reduction. But if you're applying now, your uh, amount is going to be based off your current payroll. Well, or and then 2019 if, and 2020 or 2020 payroll. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm, sure I'm clear on the question, but hopefully that answered it. Yeah, and if you have a, if you can maybe clarify your question, that'd be super too, so. All right, we have a couple more. Um, huh. I'm being asked if I can participate in the Rochester <laughs> Regional <laughs> Chamber on Thursday, January 21st. Well, uh, I can as a private citizen, um, but I, I will no longer be the regional administrator at noon on Wednesday uh, since I am a political appointee of the president. 
Because you'll get Brian and I. So I suspect yeah. that that's Elena Campbell who might be on there or um, one of our other friends in Rochester. I mean, Brian isn't as attractive as me, so <laughs> I, I apologize, but Brian will, Brian and Kathy will, will do just great. I can't even hold a candle to Rob or Brian. All right, let's see. Um, it looks like we may have answered all of our um, questions just going through. Well, let me just read this. Go ahead, Rob. Well, there was one, uh, it's talking about the 1099 question. It says, can you provide more guidance on the 1099 question, please? In 2019, I was challenged having a competitive wages and balancing expertise in this gig economy. So all my re resources are 1099 programmers. With that said, can you provide guidance on options for the second PPP loan process? So I, I'll answer and Brian, see if, you know, if, if you agree or have anything to add, but Again, these 1099 employees, I understand it's a gig economy, but they themselves can apply it. And I get like computer programming world, that's it's a gig economy. Um, but like same with like Uber drivers and everything, they themselves can apply for a PPP. Nothing prevents you as the business owners, um, you know, who you know obviously send the 1099s, you yourself can get a PPP for your for your personal self, um, and then also those qualified business expenses, but to actually um, claim those 1099 employees as part of your payroll calculation, you cannot do that. So this is for the Congresswoman and Rob. Thank you for working together across the aisle. We need more of this, especially now. We will miss you, Rob. Thanks for all your hard work. I yeah. couldn't agree more. There, there's, um, one issue, there's one issue with the Congresswoman. She's not an Ohio State Buckeye fan. <laughs> Never, never. It's um. There are some things that we cannot transcend, no matter what, that are built into the system. But um, I echo the sentiments of the of uh, whoever just made that comment. Um, I think right now, in particular, we really need um, as much as possible to remember that when we have overlapping interests and overlapping principles, we need to double down and reinvest in, in those things. We all care about saving our small businesses. We all care about our community storefronts being full and giving our kids um, that vibrant downtown community wherever we live. So um, it's been my pleasure to work with Rob and it I think is a, has been a, a really important demonstration of what we can all do in our lives, which is focus on where we have shared interests and build back that connective tissue um, so that we can talk about the tougher stuff. And Rob, is, and Rob and I have talked about tougher stuff, but because we have that relationship of trust, it allows us to, to disagree without being disagreeable and we need that now more than ever. Thank you. Um, we have... Uh, Two last questions. One is the idle advance open or will it be available? Uh, so Congress uh, did allocate another 20 billion to the idle advance program. Um, and this is to talk a little bit about internal uh, SBA stuff. Um, we have a backlog of folks that applied for it when we first opened it up. Um, so we're working through that now. We, we kind of internally don't know how we're gonna handle that. And that is kind of being left up to the next administration to figure out how they wanna do it. Um, but my my assumption would be they would still follow the, you know, the prior guidelines where it's one employee for per 1,000 and, you know, opening up the portal for folks to apply for the idle advance. Um, it's not something you just flip the switch and, it, and it's there. So I would probably um, look and in a few weeks, it likely may come back available. The way for you to stay updated on that is sign up for our updates. We, we send email updates every couple of days and we ping people and say, okay, the portal is gonna be opening up. Here's the link, this is when it's gonna open up. So be there to certainly apply. So go to sba.gov and there's like a little email sign up on the corner there, sign up for our updates so that uh, you're on top of it. I'm sure the Congresswoman will, her office will update you as well. They probably have an email. I, I guarantee you they have an email uh, update. So sign up for hers as well. One last question before we close this out. Because of lost revenue in 2020, I had to take less W-2 wages. 2019 was normal. Can I use my 2019 payroll for my calculate? Well, you're, you're going to be comparing. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't use your 2019, Brian. I mean, you, you can do a quarter by 
quarter to quarter um, comparison, or you can do an annual comparison. Um, Brian, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's exactly right for the comparison. Uh, that's 100% right. As for your payroll calculations, you can use your 2020 payroll costs or your 2019 payroll costs. Yeah, that, yeah. so that, that answered that. Um, we have one more. How is a housing cooperative defined? You you would have to look at the legislation. I do know housing cooperatives were included in the omnibus bill um, that could qualify for the PPP program. I don't exactly know how a housing, I'm sure there's a reference to it in the statute. If you send Catherine an email or send me an email, um, I'm robert.scott, S-C-O-T-T -T, at SBA.gov. I will link you to the statute and the actual uh, place where it actually defines a housing cooperative. Uh, so you can see, you know, if, if, you, if you fall into that definition as a housing cooperative. So I, I will help you, but also note, you have to work with your lender. The PPP program is completely on the lender's hands. We give them delegated authority. So if you're a housing cooperative and you're going to apply and you may get pushback from your lender, have your lender reach out to the SBA uh, and we'll do everything we can to talk to the lender and, and make sure that you can uh, fit into that category uh, so that you can qualify for the PPP program. Hey, Rob, I can uh, touch on that just a, a little bit more if, if they're interested. Uh, we the, the definition in the CARES Act is um, leaves a little homework, but housing cooperatives extends PPP eligibility to housing cooperatives defined in Section 216B, as in Bravo, of the IRS Code of 1986, which employ uh, and which employs no more than 300 people. So you can probably get with your tax advisor, or you could probably Google it, but it's uh, Section 216B of the IRS Code that definition of housing cooperative is what we are going by. Not, nothing is more fun than reading tax code. <laughs> we did have another question come in. What if you declined an idle loan last year because you didn't get the advance? Do I have to go out and fill another one? Um, they, they applied for a regular idle loan, but not the advance, is that the question? They applied for the loan and didn't get the advance, or they declined the loan, excuse me, they declined the loan because they didn't get an advance. Yeah, they will They will have to reapply. Um, I don't, they, they may be able to email us and we may be able to do a reconsideration, but if you declined it, I think you have to start over again. I'm not 100% certain on that question, but email yeah. Kathy or myself or Brian, um, their emails are up there and I will hunt that down for you, but I'm fairly certain you have to reapply. Great. Well, um, wonderful questions. Great content. Thank you so much for joining us. Rob, do you want to say a few closing remarks? Yeah, and then I'll turn it over to the congressman. But uh, certainly thank you, everyone, uh, all you small businesses that are uh, on this, this webinar. There's going to be many more of these, um, not only from the SBA, but I'm sure the congresswoman's office is going to do many more of these with us. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to get you the information um, so that you, you can obviously tap into the programs that have been offered uh, to you to hopefully get you to the end of this pandemic, light at the end of the tunnel so that you can be prosperous. Just because um, you, we couldn't get to your questions or if you think of a question later today or tomorrow, feel free to reach out to the SBA. I mean, again, you pay our salaries, we're here for you. Our sole mission at the SBA right now is to make sure that you survive and to connect you with resources. So please, please, please hit us up. We'll do everything we can to get you an answer um, so that you can be certainly successful and, and grow and, and, and keep, keep folks employed because uh, you are the American economy right now. And, and we thank you for, for hanging in there and doing everything you're doing uh, for the business community and your community. So with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, the staff there in Michigan uh, for doing this. Certainly, uh, Kathy and Brian uh, from my office, uh, Peggy, uh, and I see Will Washington's on it from headquarters. And then uh, I would like to turn it over to the Congresswoman, but I certainly thank the Congresswoman for her time, um, for being on this, and, and certainly uh, making it available for all of you. So Congresswoman. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I will just say to our, our business owners and our chambers and folks who are watching, um, I really feel more than ever squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you're having trouble, if you're not sure about something, please reach out to us. Of course, reach out to the SBA. 
Um, we have found that the businesses, there's a lot of businesses that are squeaking, so you shouldn't feel um, uh, ashamed of that. You should feel proud of that because that's what you're doing to try and save your business. So please reach out to either the SBA in Michigan or our office so that we can help connect you um, to the information that you need. Um, and then again, in addition to the staff who has just done a great job of, of outreach, I mean, I'll be honest, I did not spend a ton of time in my national security life before being a member of Congress with the SBA. And I was telling the staff before we got on, um, you know, I really feel like the SBA has become one of our sort of national security agencies because you are doing, they are doing so much to help our economy stay afloat. And we can't protect ourselves and we can't be the country we want to be without our businesses surviving and thriving. So thank you to the team. And then again, personally to Rob for your friendship, for your advice, for your counsel, for helping thousands of Michigan businesses in our district, saving hundreds of a hundred, over 100,000 jobs in our district. Um, that means something. We will not forget it. And we wish you the best of luck. We know you're going to do go on and do great things. Uh, so thank you for all your work in a really unprecedented time. Thank you, Congressman. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I think we're adieu, setting adieu. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.